there's two things that I want to go over. One, I want to use a more complicated data set. It's still tiny, but there are a lot more features. And I want to show you how to pull out a validation set because it is such an important problem. OK, so I've got the usual support code here. I've got all my standard imports. And then um, I'm going to use a plot routine to plot the history of the loss function as we go through and compute it. But that's just a little bit of support code. You can assume that this is just plotting some curves. And I'll show you what they look like in a second. OK, so let me just make sure I'm getting all this executed. And so the diabetes data set is a well-known toy data set that is useful when you're first learning. Uh, it's not a super useful data set by today's standards. This would have been big back in the maybe early 90s. All right, so there's a built-in function that will give it to you from scikit-learn. And scikit-learn is uh, sort of the standard structured data machine learning library that you will use in uh, the next class, the machine learning class we do. OK, so this is just going to give you the data. And it gives you back a number of things. For example, if I just uh, show you this, it kind of dumps a bunch of stuff. And it's got a bunch, it's got a description. And it's got other stuff. But um, all we care about, oh. come on, let me merge. Uh, oh, that's weird. It's not letting me. Select two and then merge. Oh, there we go. OK. Um, so I'm just really, I got the data and I get into a variable and I say, OK, how much data do I have? I have 442 records. OK. So much easier if I get this into a data frame and I pull out the features from uh, this object that comes back. And I'm also going to take the target, our y variable, and I'm going to make it a field or a column of this data frame. I just like to have everything in a data frame so I can do manipulations and so on. That way, if I move a record around, the target value moves with it. OK, so there's a variety of features associated with an individual. Uh, this is uh, mass, body mass index, blood pressure, and so on and so on. And this will give a numeric indication of their risk for uh, disease, what do they call it, disease progression in one year after baseline. OK. So uh, I always start out by looking at the data just to see what it looks like. And uh, we did that in the exploratory data analysis. And so here's a couple of the sample records. All right, so as we saw in the slides, we don't care so much about the training error. In other words, we train a model on a certain set of data. And if I give it that exact same data back, does that really tell me anything when I ask how accurate it is? It's kind of like if I give you the exam before I, if I give you the entire exam filled out with the answers before I test you on it, it's no surprise that you're going to do well on that exam, right? Because you've seen all the answers. So that's not super amazing. That could be really just a hash table. What we really care about is how this model is going to perform on records that it was not trained on. And so we care about its generality. And there are three sets that we name when we're being very careful. That's a training set, the validation set, and the test set. The training set is obviously the chunk that we use to create the model. And the validation set is what we use to determine how the model performs. And these validation records were not used in training. And so it gives us some idea of how the model would perform in general. The test set is something that we've taken out at the beginning and we've held on to and we never look at it. We never run it through the model until the very end, once we think we have a good model. Because, we, because we've been tuning the model and iterating on this thing, the validation set is somehow kind of baked into the model, or at least knowledge of it. So the only true measure of generality, an, obje an objective measure, is the test set. So we run that through at the end. And that would be, say, what I published in a paper. I say, OK, well, the generality, this is an estimate of our generality. All right. So we have to do this. And in our case, we're just going to pull out a validation set. And colloquially, it's OK to call it a test set, uh, even though if we're being very careful, we know that 
there are actually three different sets. All right, so standard uh, template for me to pull stuff out of a data frame is I drop the target and get the values out. That just gives me the NumPy matrix. And then from the target, I get the NumPy array. No surprise. And then here's our first new function. So this train test split comes from scikit-learn as well, it comes from the model selection area. And it's actually pretty flexible. Uh, in my particular case, I'm passing in uh, separated the X and the Y pieces. So the feature vectors and the target. And then this ratio says, I want 20% held out as the test set. So if I, if I do that particular operation, then I can say like length of train, see length of X and uh, length of X test. So you can see I had this many records originally and I've cut it down to that for training and I've held out 89 for validation. So this is just a convenient record and you can see it gives me a tuple back with four arrays that I can then use for training models and testing and so on. Okay, so um, also remember that to improve the speed of training our models, which can often be quite long, it's a really good idea to normalize our variables. So this is not for reasons of interpretation of these coefficients or any of that stuff that you did in linear regression. This is purely to make our training go faster. And so to, we say whiten in, a, in engineering, we would talk about you know uh, white noise, pink noise, uh, whitening signals. And I'm shifting it so its mean is zero. And I can do that by simply computing the mean, subtracting it. And then I normalize the range by dividing by the standard deviation. So, and I do this on both data sets. And notice I'm doing it on just the X and not the target. Doesn't serve any purpose in the target. Okay, so anytime I'm building a model, I wanna know how good it is. And one of the ways to answer that question is to compare it to some known baseline. So I'm sure you got uh, an earful about R squared when you did linear regression. Linear or R squared is really measuring how your model does compared to what a model would do if it just produced the mean all the time. So how good are you versus just predicting the average? So I'm just doing something a little more sophisticated here. I'm using a standard uh, model, which we'll go into in great detail in the machine learning class. And that's called a random forest. It's a forest of decision trees. Each one fit with a subset of the data so that they're not completely correlated. And through playing around, I found that I needed 500 trees. And that was just to get a good a good result, but that's more or less uh, the most important meta parameter you have to manipulate. And um, I set it high and usually it just kind of works out. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this into a Y column vector so that it's the proper shape for this training. So I'm passing in X and Y and the way you train any model in scikit-learn is calling the fit method. So I've created a model and it was initialized, but of course it wasn't fit. So then I call the fit and this has in fact created a random forest model that knows how to map X features to Y. And how well? Well, let's figure that out. So I could be using R squared here. That's easy enough. If I use the score method, I can print that out. Um, to get a more sort of interpretable result, I'm just gonna do a mean squared error uh, just for the moment, because that means my loss function and my metric are the same. When I want to determine how good my model is, I have to ask the model to make a prediction. So I'm going to do it on the training data. And it should be pretty good at this because that's what it was trained on. So I get the predictions out. And so this is going to be a vector of floats. And then I just, because uh, I'm too lazy to figure out what the function is called, I just do my own mean squared error. So there's my residual. I'm squaring all the elements in the vector, and then I'm just saying, what's the mean? So that's mean squared error. Okay, the same is true. I'm using the exact same model, except I'm passing in my validation set yet. 
and I spell it test because I got tendonitis and I'm not going to spell validation out every time. So uh, I just call it a test, even though it's technically not my testing. So now I get a different set of results out. And of course, it'll be a different height. And I do my mean squared error. So I print these things out. So um, I've got a very big difference here between training and validation. Why is that? Yeah, it's basically, um, now this is accentuated because remember we squared the residual. So if there's even one outlier, it could get really, really big, right? Um, but if, if I were looking at mean absolute error, it may not be that big. But so we're, when you see a difference, you expect the training error to be as good as you could possibly get with that particular model. Whereas the validation error, it's being tested on things it has not seen before. And if these are radically different, then you could think, all right, well, I'm probably overfitting this thing. And it depends on the metric. And here I'm using something that, that's sensitive to outlier. So uh, I wouldn't make a snap judgment on that, but yeah, so that, that's why this is different. It's like, if I give you the answers to the test, you're gonna do well on that exam. And now I'm asking you to do a test where you've never seen the questions before. And if we have a general model, then if you've generally understood the content, then when you do the exam, you should do pretty well. And overfitting comes in often when we, well, a necessary condition is when the training error is low and the validation error is very high. All right, so this is just our baseline, right? So we're just getting some idea of how well we can do with a decent model. And random forest is great because you don't have to think real hard. You know, I could have, I, I just tried a couple of values here and it worked. And I know some of the other hyperparameters and I played around, but this was more or less good enough. Okay, and you know, that will train super fast. So now let's see if we can do that with a neural net and see if we can do any better. Okay, Oop, I gotta get my uh, chat line up, sorry. Uh, let's see, do we determine which metric to report based upon the application? And what are the, okay, so it depends on whether we're doing, uh, you know, regression or classification. And it really depends on the problem. If I'm doing, uh, it's complicated because if I'm doing numerics, like a number, if I'm doing dollars, and the numbers are really close, it might be good to know I'm a dollar off. But a different application for the same thing with, with dollars, you might wanna know the ratio. Oh, you're 20% off, right? So as Unet says, it really depends on the problem and um, even on the characteristics of the values you're creating. Now, very often in classification, we'll, um, We'll do precision and recall, F1. We'll, we'll do a lot of different things. Um, and yeah, we often use R squared for regression. And if you wanted to look at that, it's, it's pretty easy. It's just the standard score function if this is a regressor. So uh, let's see, do I have to pass? Okay, so it's test and Y test. Um, is that what we're getting out of here? Wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. We should be better than that. Well, anyway, the R square is terrible. And by the way, notice it can be negative in the general case. It's just when you, when you're doing linear regression, generally they say it's between zero and one, but that's a special case. So it can be arbitrarily negative because it's how bad are you compared to a mean model? So this is not doing what I, ex I would have expected this to be better. It is an order of magnitude better, but anyway, I, I can look at that again. Okay, so the other questions we had here, uh, how do you know 500 trees is a good number? Well, I started with 100 and I went zero, up until it zero, uh, Well, zero is the, is the mean. So, so both of them are, you know, your train is also very bad, so. Yeah, it is bad, but zero is only the minimum for linear regression. Um, last time I looked at the equation, you could get arbitrarily negative. Well, what, what I'm saying is that, yeah, you can get arbitrarily negative, but that, that means that your, your model is worse than just breaking the mean. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So these are terrible. <laughs>
but uh, it does seem to be, well, it's such a small sample, uh, data set, it's hard to, uh, but it does seem like it should be better than this, but um, I, I can look at the mean absolute error. Uh, let's see, what other questions we got here? Yeah, so on the number of trees, I just started, uh, I start with 100 usually and I go upwards. Um, and uh, let's see, why do we use, okay, why do we not have a test set here? Because uh, I was lazy and we have so so little data. Um, but if I were doing this for real, then I would separate three of these things out. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can also do cross validation for hyperparameter tuning. Uh, however, for random forest, I, ne I never do that because it's so easy to tune. Okay. All right. So let's see if we can train a neural network model and see uh, how much better we are. Uh, let me just put this in here. I can push this back. Uh, you know, what do you mean if you have a lot of data, you use one validation set? You mean you you use one and a validation set, or what do you mean? So they are talking about cross-validation. Oh, cross-validation. Uh, cross uh, yeah, and so what happens uh, sometimes is that if your model is very cheap to train uh, and you don't have that much data, cross-validation makes sense. But then sometimes if your model is very, you know, it takes a while to train and so on, and you have a lot of data, and then people in deep learning a lot, they just use one validation set. So they just, based on one validation set, they do that. But you can totally use cross-validation. It's just that everything is gonna take a lot longer because the training sometimes takes a lot longer. Yeah, like some of your models, they train like for two days, right, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't, you don't wanna, yeah. Yeah, okay. So let's um, go back to our uh, neural net stuff now and train this thing. Okay. We have the same optimizer and this allows us to do, uh, first we reset everything and then we're updating our model parameters based upon the derivatives that were computed in this step. Okay, so this optimizer says, hey, what are your parameters to the model? You know, what are your betas? And then it's going to do the update step where it says, you know, the new beta is equal to the old beta minus the learning rate times the gradient. And it's gonna, it hides all that kind of stuff. So how does it know what the gradients are? That occurs in this step and we're computing all partial derivatives with respect uh, to each parameter, but um, the derivative loss with respect to each parameter. And so I've just got this pattern in my head. And once I figured out what it is, I just paste it in and I never think about it again because it just works. Okay, so just as we did above where we're running the entire, uh, an entire chunk of data through and getting a bunch of different targets out, we do the same thing with our model. Taking my model and I'm giving it my entire training data, I'm getting the predictions out, and then I'm computing mean squared error loss. And this is just for printing purposes. And then from this loss, there's a function on it called backward that is part of one of these, um, tensors that we're going to create here. Okay, so this is the critical, but the simplest possible training loop there is. So generally you have an optimizer of some kind so that we do this kind of stuff and it relies on the computation of loss. And so you have to specify what that is. To compute the loss, we have to make a prediction. That prediction is based on our training data. And so that's why we need all that stuff. Now, my general function takes in test X and Y, but we're not using it yet. Okay, so I get my train zero in there. And then here I'm just converting the NumPy stuff to uh, torch tensors, high torch tensor. So it's just a different data structure. Okay, so the model we're gonna use takes in, it's actually more than this, right? We had, uh, I can't remember the number of features there. We could look it up, it's probably 10, 20 or something like that. So this column is actually uh, like a 20 vector or something. And I have, I'm gonna make 150 neurons. 
So this is actually quite tall. I just didn't want to draw that many boxes. And then as usual, when I glue together nonlinear unit or linear units, I glue them together with a nonlinear unit, which is just our relative. So out comes 150 vector, which I then threshold, I clip with this relu, I get 150 vector out. And then I multiply it by 150 weights and add a, uh, a bias term. And that gives me a scalar. And that is my prediction for my regression. So in PyTorch, this is quite simple. I'm creating a sequential model and I'm making a linear unit that takes in number of columns, which is, just, let's just figure out what that is. Okay, there's, there's 10 features. So it's gonna convert a 10 vector to a 150 vector based on this. And then I say, run all that stuff through this nonlinearity. Then I combine those 150 answers to get one single output. And then this model, this object, is what I'm gonna pass into our little training method here. And then by playing around, I figured out what a, an acceptable learning rate is and how many epochs I'm gonna to need to make this thing train. So starts out with a really bad training loss, but then quickly gets better and then slowly makes more progress. Uh, let me make sure I've got all the right data in here. I thought it got a little lower than that. Ah, there we go. I knew those numbers look weird. I had already run the, so I was running on X and Y from below. Okay, so now this R squared looks pretty good. <laughs> So the R squared is pretty good for training, but eh, not so good for validation, right? Okay. Okay, so I've got my training loop. So you can see that quickly driving this training loss low. That is our goal. Remember, our goal is I've got this massive feature space and I'm moving a point in feature space where I'm changing, uh, I'm sorry, parameter space, where I'm changing the parameters of my model and then I go up and see what the loss function is. And where I find the lowest loss, I go, oh, hey, this point is really good in parameter space. Okay, so that's, that's my goal here. Um, okay, so this shows the number of iterations I have. And so I'll run this a few more times. Notice that it's not monotonic. Why does training sometimes pop the loss function up? How could it possibly, because it's using the gradient to always go towards lower loss, how can I possibly have a higher loss? Maybe your, your learning rate is a ah, bit higher. Not you, you did. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to ask something. Uh, oh, okay, can go you ahead. Also, can you also print the, um, the validation loss so that yeah, we understand? Yeah, that's what I have next. I do that next. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make the simplest possible training loss. <laughs> okay, when yeah, why why uh, why is the training loss shown not monotonically decreasing? Um, if the learning rate is too large, it, it's what? If the learning rate is too large. If it's too it, large, oh, interesting. What does that mean? Why why why? How would this happen? Oh, that's right. Um, I actually do not know. Okay, let's go back to a picture. Uh, there we go. Uh, let me switch gears. It would bounce to the other side of the parabola where you have um, yep. a value. Yep, check this out. So if the learning rate is too high, what happens is, so I'm I, the director points this direction. However, when I tell it to go in that direction, the learning rate is so high, it goes all the way over here, but the loss for that is up here. So it actually looks like it, it would be going this way. So that's how, if it's bouncing too far, then that's how you're gonna see uh, a, a non-monotonic loss function. And that's why we tend to use uh, variable learning rates so that as we get closer, we're gonna go and just, you know, kind of, zoom in on that thing at the end with a, a cyclic learning rate or a square wave, sawtooth wave, something. Okay. Professor, I have a yes. question. 
Um, so I remember last class you mentioned that there's no real standard on on how to figure out what's the optimal learning rate. It's based mainly on practice and intuition. Mm -hmm. um, when I went through Fast AI, I know Jeremy Howard said the same thing, but he has like this nice little graph and um, ways to figure out what might be a sweet spot. Is there any way we could do that with PyTorch? Um, yes, in general. So Jeremy has a lot of experience and he, he, I don't know if he was telling you about in general how it works, uh, how to do that, but there are generally, I'm sure, tricks and guidelines where you can try some stuff. But he has some he type of test. Um, yeah, he has some type of test that you can oh, run, play with it a little bit, and eventually, like what Terence was telling you, just like I prefer to do the opposite. I prefer to find the largest learning rate that doesn't diverge. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I start kind of high, you know, you start at one, you know, you make it diverge, right? And then you go down. You start at one, you know, usually one diverges except in some cases. So you start with 1.0, 0, 0, 0.1, sorry, 0.1. It diverges, you go to 0 0.001, or point, you know, you go down one zero. And then, and then if you get to a point that is good, then you say, well, let me multiply by five or whatever, you know, like, so you try to kind of by hand kind of do it. I think it's, um, uh, it's not diverging so you, at all. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so oh, that one, lie. you know, it, it did that. Uh, no, 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 actually, that, that's okay. Yeah, oh, oh I, thought, I thought that was going to diverge. <laughs> yeah, but it's it, it's not diverging, but it's not yeah, getting yeah, it's you. Yeah, it's not always. It's, but, it's yeah, not you, getting you, like, uh, yeah, in some cases, you you see just how it either diverge or actually gets you a good rate, like, you know, so you can, in, in this case, um, yeah, so basically, I like to kind of find the highest one that would, kind of go down yeah. instead of sometimes I'm too conservative and it's just, you know, this one is gonna take forever. Like that rate that trans has there, it's gonna take forever to get anywhere, right? So so there is, and I can show you how to do that, but I have kind of, I lost my faith on, on, on that method. I, there is a paper that described that method on how to, to find the best learning rate. So yeah, so as you know, pointed out, when this learning rate is really low like this, for the same number of epochs, look, I, I didn't get anywhere near zero. But what you do notice is, I think it's monotonic. Yes, at least it's monotonic now. So I know that when I get near the bottom, I'll probably start doing better. Like you can increase the number of epochs, but you know, especially on a CPU and not a GPU, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty slow to get down there. And so I didn't get, yeah, I didn't get much further there. Um, anyway, so that's the, that that this is how you learn stuff. You try, all right, well, let's try this one and see what this does. All right, that's a little better. Uh, it's also close to monotonic. You know, and then you try like three, and uh, you start getting it. You know, trying to go as high as you can and getting it. You know, really low. So, uh, I think one reasonable approach is to drive your training loss really, really low, and then worry about regularization and, and how to fix the overfit. This is super specific now to our training set. Um, okay, so um, and I have these little these little questions and stuff in here. You can look back at these later. And so a reasonable thing to do when you're doing this on your own is to start a new notebook and go. Okay, so let me get the you know cut and paste the training mob, uh, training thing in there, and you know cut and paste the part where you get the data. Anyway, so then you get like a little notebook which is just here's how I train a model for this data set. And then you can see this little thing on the screen and yeah, you maybe haven't typed it in, but it gives you a nice little thing to play with and you get some confidence that yes, you can train that model. So that's a reasonable learning approach, I think. Oh, we got plenty of time. Okay, so that's our, our basic model. Um, so yeah, in fact, that I'll put that back up at eight where I think I was playing with it. Um, where it was non-monotonic. And so that's what I did here is I started playing around with learning rate. So I wanted it to keep getting lower, but I wanted it to be kind of monotonic. And depending on um, how we, how many, you know, every time we run this, it's gonna be slightly different because of the randomness inherent in the initialization. Um, and every time I change the architecture, this is gonna be different. So another thing you, you could try is saying, all right, well, what happens if I only have 50 neurons? 
Well, it's not learning very fast. Although I was getting pretty good at the end. So you say, all right, well, wow, that's actually 50 neurons and it trains a lot faster. Let's see if I can get it and drive it down a little further. Oh, by the way, notice I had 8,000 epics on it. So you go, oh, I quite didn't get it down. Let's try five. And so you just play around with these things because we're just trying to reduce our bias. And that's, that's a little high, uh, maybe because last time I think it would be better. Anyway, so you can play around with a number of neurons and so on. Uh, so the only thing in this case that was fixed is the data set I'm using. Okay, so this one seems to be pretty good. I've got enough neurons and I'm getting it really close to zero. So that means at least on the training set, I've got no bias or almost no bias. You, I, I wanted to mention that, you know, sometimes going up and down a little bit is not that bad. Right. Because you see it right here, you know, it went from three to four and then back to one. So don't be too, too picky about it. Sometimes it can go up, but you want it eventually to go more down than it used to be by, by a lot, you know. So you want to try to find that learning rate that, um, yeah, that takes you the, the lowest you, you can. Yeah, so now let's, um, as you suggested earlier, let's add the validation loss. So we've got both sets. And so if we can watch both the training loss and the validation loss at the same time, then we get a, a much better picture of how our model is doing. And then we can actually draw a picture and uh, you'll see that they often, the neural net is so powerful that it'll often drive the training air very low, but the validation air will start to get really, really bad. And so we want to have just some, uh, like a, a scope on the training and see where it's going. It will also tell us how early we can stop or whether we should keep going or whatever. Okay, so the only thing I've done, I've got the exact same thing, I've got the optimizer. And here's the thing that I've got tattooed on my left forearm that I just paste every time. And here is the training pred uh, prediction and loss computation that I had before. Um, and I'm just going to do the uh, I'm just going to do the exact same thing now for the test set. So look, I'm passing in test versus train, and then I have to make sure I'm using the right y. Uh, so this gives me the loss associated with my test set, otherwise known as my validation set. And then this this little magic here just doesn't print it every time. It just says, hey, I'm going to print out ten numbers, and if I ever get to that, uh, so you can always see I'm always printing ten numbers. Um, if that's the case, then I print out both the loss and the test loss. That's the only difference between these things, okay? So that's train number one, uh, the other was train zero. Okay, so I do the exact same thing. I've got the same model as I had from before. I've got a linear unit that's got 150 neurons and it's run through a ReLU and then I convert that to a scalar by running it through a final layer. Um, you know, we call this the output layer, right? And then this is the hidden layer. Yeah, yeah. I'm it's, always confused. It's, like, and it's then what's funny the because uh, our um, the 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 layer itself goes from. So there is the input layer, which is the. Yeah, but that's really just the X, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I always yeah. I always found that weird yeah. why that was a layer, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I tend not to get too hung up on uh, architectural uh, nomenclature here uh, with their own nets because everyone seems to. Do something different with it. Okay, so I've got the exact same model and I'm going to call my train one function, but notice also that I'm tracking the, the different losses in a couple so that when I send those back, convert it to a tensor, but I'm going to send it back so that I can do some plotting. So all of these numbers get put into this history that comes back and then I can call this magic function that I created from above. And I also clipped the loss at 12,000 just because otherwise it'd be this really tall graph. And then this, I could cut this out. This just saves the local file so I can cut and paste any notes or whatever. Okay, so what do we see here visually? Well, okay, the training loss, as we saw from before, it's pretty good. It drops very close to zero. And that's what you can see visually here. On the other hand, look what happened to the test loss or validation loss. Starts out really high and gets pretty good. And then it's like, whoa, starting to get really bad. So what we've learned here is that as this learning rate gets really close to zero, we clearly must be overfitting because 
To get a loss of zero means that I can perfectly reproduce my input. But given the natural world that we live in, there's noise, there's errors, we must be chasing some vagaries of the data. Okay, we're too specific to that data if we let it get too far. Doesn't mean we have too complex of a model necessarily, although that is one way to reduce this overfitting. So we could stop early, say here, well, where is that? We don't really know. So another way to do that, as we'll see next, is to track the best and um, choose that one. Uh, but anyway, so this is a very typical structure that I've seen where validation loss, you're like, woohoo, or uh, training loss, you get really good, but you're like, oh crap, don't get too excited because look at your validation loss. And this, this orange curve, to be clear, this is what matters. The blue line doesn't matter. However, if the blue line is up here too, then you're screwed, right? So getting a low blue line for train is, is needed, but it's not sufficient. Okay, so one of the things you can do is as not just tracking the history, we can actually track the best model. So as we go down here, this, this could get very noisy depending on the, the data I have. So you just pick the model, regardless of whether it's early or late, you pick the model that gives you the lowest validation loss, because that's what you care about. So that just means I have an extra conditional inside my loop. That's the only difference. Everything else is the same. So I tracked the history before for plotting purposes, but I passed the history out now and the best model. And the best model is a copy of this model. So this, this copy package, there's a deep copy method that chases all of the pointers in the code in the object. So everything that this model points at, because it's going to be a sequential object, and then the sequential object will have various layers, and the layers will have parameters and so on. I want a complete copy of this thing I call deep copy. Okay, so I track that and then I can return. And maybe this isn't the best way to do it, but you know it works certainly for this little problem. So again, I have the exact same model. And now I'm gonna call train two, which is the exact same training loop, except I'm gonna return not only the history, but the best model. So now when I run this with the exact same learning rate, and now I, I can look at this and determine that you know what, this is not gonna get any better. So I'm gonna cut it off like right here. There's no point in going any further. And so that's why you see me cutting this number of epics down to a thousand from 8,000, because this is just totally unnecessary. All it does is get worse. And that's very common. Okay, so now I run this thing. And so I've zoomed in, I don't have as many epochs. But you can see that my best test loss is 3,000. And it comes pretty early. So that's also pretty good news. Now let's compare this. Look at this MSE uh, test loss. Let's go back to our random forest. And that's 3,700 versus our 3,000. So we just beat the crap out of a random forest, which is pretty good. And so you can see here that um, it very quickly landed on that. There was an initial like train from, oh my God, it's terrible to something really good. And then it's slowly starting getting worse. And then ultimately it's gonna get really good, the validation loss. So, so, so Terence, this is why I like the R square, right? Because I just don't remember what your MSC of your best uh, random forest model was. But I do remember yeah. the R yeah, square yeah. was like 0 0.29, right? That's right? Because it's a more, so that's why I like to uh, compute R squares and okay. print R squares too. Sure, yeah. let's do that. Yeah, because it's, it's uh, always the same units, right? Exactly. So I can remember them, but I cannot yeah, yeah. remember MSCs. Um, there we go. Okay. So the R squared is much better. The other one was 0.29, and this one's 0.42. Mm -hmm. Although the training one. Is this... 
Trend. No, but that's just uh, that. That's just the fact that you. Um, that doesn't matter, right? You don't. Yeah, it doesn't about, matter. You but can I'm just get a, to an R squared of one if you want. Oh, it's because I, oh, I, I didn't drive it down very far. That's why. Exactly. I cut exactly. it off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll add this and I'll push this back to you guys. Oh, that's awesome. So the actually why I want to print this next to the uh, train loss. Mm -hmm. and validation loss is because in this case the r square and the loss and they are optimizing the same thing but suppose that you are also um you worry about uh, accuracy right accuracy and log loss are not optimizing the same thing so you may want to yeah, find right. the model with the best accuracy not the model with the best log loss right so anyways, I like to print it next to what you have here on the right side. Yeah, so if, we, if we're doing classification, certainly, or if we had a different metric, and we can also, we could, you know, if we're doing this for real, we want to put all the metrics in the right spot and I should label them and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so we can see that the validation error, or R squared is much better than the um, uh, one we got from the random forest. Okay, that's great because it didn't it didn't take us that long to build this simple little model here, but it is more work than just calling random forest. Okay, um, so we are going to go into more detail than you wanted uh, in the machine learning course on regularization. The idea is we've got a situation like this. We have a very powerful model, but that power works against this in many ways because it gets too specific to that particular training data and then it screws up on the data we care about, which is the data it hasn't seen. So what do we do about that? Well, there's a number of things we can do and we talked about that in the um, uh, slides, let's see. So we looked at these slides. So first thing you can do is get more training data if you want. And that just gives us a better idea of what the overall distribution of the population looks like. Or, you know, we can try a simpler model, but, you know, that might increase the bias. It might, it might increase our accuracy. So that may not be the right idea, but it could work. And there's this cool thing called dropout that will, uh, that I think Yannette will talk about. And it basically says, let's, let's hit this model on the head with a coconut occasionally and knock out some of the neurons. And that will prevent it from getting too good at its training data because you're, you're kind of messing it up a little bit, adding some randomness. And one of the other things is weight decay. So we're gonna talk about this in class later as an L2 regularization on those model parameters. All it's saying is, hey, you know what? If model parameters, the betas get really, really big, that usually doesn't work out generalization-wise. And so we're simply going to constrain the search space so that the parameters can't get too big. Okay, and we can kind of do early stopping, which is this thing we just looked at, uh, where we kind of pick the, an early and uh, less tuned model. Um, and some other kind of things, but let's let's go back and take a look at this notebook. Let's talk about uh, weight decay. So this uh, is something we'll explore, as I said, in more detail about what it actually is and why it works. But it's a super easy thing for us to use in deep learning because we're using this built-in Atom optimizer. Atom is just the name of a adaptive blah 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 something something. Uh, it's a it's a built-in optimizer that knows how to do a really good job of um, finding the minimum loss function in a large search space. So all I've done is add a weight decay parameter. And of course I have to pass that in to my new in, uh, implementation of my training method, but everything else is the same, right? So I've got my, hey, compute my training loss, compute my validation loss, keep track of it, do some printing. And then here's the standard thing that makes it go around and get closer to the lower loss. So the only thing I'm doing is passing in a parameter to Adam. So weight decay, as I said, um, it's just a matter of constraining the search space because uh, imagine if, well, 
we'll, we'll look at this in great detail later, but just trust me for now that we're going to make a bargain, which is that if you allow me to bias the model a little bit, I can reduce the overfitting by constraining these weight parameters, uh, these, these parameters. And so this is yet another hyperparameter that we have to set. So now we've got not only learning rate, but I've got to deal with this weight decay. So one of the things I like to do is to try out multiple variations. So this is kind of like what somebody was talking about cross validation or whatever. I'll often try multiple weight decays to see which one gives me the best training loss. So again, I'm not using R squared here that, uh, that Yannette likes. I just happen to be using the same uh, metric as my loss function just for fun. Um, so I'll just run this again. It doesn't take very long. Okay, so notice when I don't have any weight decay, there's no regularization, there's no constraints at all. And the best model occurs right here and then it quickly gets, gets worse. As, but if I want, I can drive this uh, training loss down very low. As I start to increase this weight decay parameter, a number of things are happening here. Notice that I'm not, I'm not driving the training loss as low as I was, so I'm biasing the model a little bit because I'm not letting it try all possible weird parameters. On the other hand, the validation error at the right edge is actually getting lower. So it started out really high, but by turning up the uh, weight decay, I actually bring this thing down quite a bit. Now I'd still probably want to pick the best model, not just leaving it to the right edge, but uh, this shows the effect of this weight decay. So for this particular data set, this particular architecture, we see that in this and and of the weight decay parameters, I've uh, uh, hyperparameters I've tried. Weight decay of 1.5 seems to be the best. Okay, so um, I would probably do a thing where I picked the best model. And, you know, sometimes, like in this particular case, if I actually did what I did before and picked the best model and didn't use weight decay, I might actually get an even better validation error, but it's hard to tell on this scale. Um, so now what's going to happen if I set, so this weight decay is like 1.5, what's gonna happen if I set it to like 100? I'm gonna change this to 100. Anybody have any idea? What that's saying is really squish the parameters so they can't really get very big. So it can't really freely search this space. <laughs> Well, let's just try it out. Okay, so here it is. What do we observe? A high flat error. It yeah, we've biased, we've error. constrained the model so much that it just can't, it just cannot learn that relationship. So the instead of going down and down and down, if you get there's going to be a certain point where the weight decay, the hyperparameter is so big that it just prevents the model from really learning. So that's basically what that's telling us. Um, so obviously that was too high. So what you'll do with this parameter hyperparameter is try different values until you find a model that gives you the lowest uh, metric or whatever you're optimizing. Okay, so I should have that written here. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Okay. All right, so that's more or less it for regression at this point. Uh, my goal was to show you a variety of training methods, but they all look kind of the same. They all look like variations of this. And there's little details that we've got in there that are bookkeeping to keep track of the history, maybe find the best model, things like that. Um, 
please remember that we can almost always create a powerful enough model to drive that training error down to zero. It may take a while, but we can do it. But that's not what we care about. We care about the validation error. We want to make sure that that is appropriate. Otherwise, we've super overfit. And then there are a number of techniques we use to reduce that overfitting. And one of them is weight decay. And that's just L2 regularization if you're a mathematician or statistician. And um, it's built into many of these optimizers. So um, let's see. I think that's more or less what we went over here. But anyway, so just driving home, you got to have at least train and validation. If you only have a training set, that doesn't tell you a damn thing about how good your model is. All that says is, is it able to memorize known answers? That's maybe useful for some applications, but certainly not to create a model that's going to make predictions in the future. Okay, so let me commit this back 